Hey everyone, <laughs> welcome to Ask Confluent, where we answer questions from the internet. I'm your host, Gwen Shapira, and this is the first uh, work from home edition of uh, Ask Confluent. We have Anna here with us on full social distancing mode. As you may have noticed, it's been around over six months. I think it's been eight months since I've been done my last Ask Confluent. The last one was filmed before the pandemic, but aired after. So I got gazillion questions. Hey Gwen, why are you and Tim not socially distancing? Hey Gwen, why are you and Tim not wearing masks? So we filmed as that one before the pandemic. This time it's during the pandemic and therefore Anna here is being a good citizen wearing a mask and uh, we are all socially distancing. And for the first time ever on Ask Confluent, my actual office and Anna's actual office. So Anna here, I'm super excited to have you. Now you can see her face. Uh, right. She's a technical account manager at uh, Confluent. She spoke at Kafka Summit. She's an all around amazing Kafka expert, very active at, at um, Twitter, did I don't even know how many meetups. It's just um, so excited to have you at the show, Anna. Thank you very much, Gwen. I'm stoked to be here. So let's get started with questions from the internet. So first question, okay, I need to preface that by saying that I slightly cheated. I went on Twitter and said, Anna is going to be on the show and she's the, one of the smartest people I know, so I want really hard questions, please. Uh, so if you see hard questions, it may have been intentional. Uh, so Dominic Evans, who is an, I think, old Twitter friend, we've been chatting pretty much forever, asked, if you could pick any one keep from the backlog that hasn't yet been implemented and have it immediately available, which one would you pick? Yeah, so this one, I'm going to actually call it out. I would pick kit 629, which is the one that was started to use racially um, uh, neutral terms in our code base. That one to me is incredibly important. Um, one of, you and know, when I- implemented it? Uh, no, it's open right now. It's getting implemented though. What are yeah. we waiting for? <laughs> yeah, I know, that's what I'm saying. Exactly, it's even the perfect answer. But my uh, mom actually is a linguist. And so language has always been, you know, very important to me, like not only what you say, but how you say it. And there's absolutely no reason why someone should have to read those types of, you know, terms when you're just trying to do your job. So I am so stoked that this is happening in the Kafka community and in our code base. So that would be the kip that I would pick. Wow. No, that's a very socially responsible uh, skip to keep it. I would still keep uh, keep 500 uh, anytime. Like, <laughs> well, 500 is actually made up of 500 kips. So is that a fair ask? I don't know. Yes, <laughs> that is a very fair thing to say. Uh, there are a lot of... What about keep 405? the tiered storage one is so, that um so yeah there, one, it right? is. The one. there's one thing about that that excites the, the heck out of me and that's the fact that it, it, i think you you brought this up on twitter is that now like one of the advice we always give people right is, is do not co-locate and don't multi-tenant when you have a batch consumer and you have real time because it blows out your page cache and then you you dump your sla and so i think you know you had brought it up that it's going to be implemented as just a network read. And so what that will end up doing, I think, is opening some of those use cases where you can, you know, support multi-tenant real time without blowing out your page cache, which is really cool. Ports multi-tenancy, it enables elasticity. It's like all the, this is what Cloud Native is all about. So yeah, I'm super stoked. Next one from Gosam. Are we able to arrive any formula for identifying consumer producer throughput rate in Kafka with a given hardware specification. So I give you, I have that much CPU, I have that much RAM, here's my network, here's my disk. How much produce consume net uh, throughput will I be able to get? Yeah, so for this, it comes down to partition, right? Um, the, I think there's a, a bit like, the, we get questions like this all the time and people want an easy answer and an easy formula and they get very, you know, discouraged when we go, it's hand wavy, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> But it, but yeah. it could have been a formula. It's just so complicated. There's so many different factors run into it. And, you know, Q series, nonlinear. So it will kind of be a pretty complicated formula. 
it would be, but, but I do think like maybe what this question is asking more, and this is kind of how I try to reframe it, you know, when I talk to people is, um, how do I tell, right? How do I tell what my throughput can be, right? Given this configuration, um, right? So like producer perf test. So the question that, that w this really comes down to, right? You, someone comes to you and they say, this is the throughput that I need, right? That's what, that's what ends up happening, right? This is my throughput, that's where you start. And so once you have that, if you know what the throughput is for a single partition, then you can extrapolate out to get whatever type of SLA or whatever type of throughput you desire. Um, so I think you, you start with benchmarking a single partition. You start with, so first of all, you start with benchmarking. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> but I'm thinking that in addition to the partition scale out, other factors would be how many connections you have, because if mm. you have a lot of clients doing the same throughput, you'll have those tiny itty bitty messages. They take up a lot of CPU. Do you use compression? Um, that would be a big one. Like, obviously, <laughs> that's a way of cheating on the network. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in general, like, if given just those, I can't really tell you your throughput. I can tell you best case and I can tell you worst case, I guess. But it will be like a huge range. Like, best case would be like one megabyte per second. And then, like, the best case would be maybe 100 times that. Right. Mm -hmm. Kewi Shang said, may I ask if incremental cooperative rebalancing also works for general Kafka consumer in addition to Kafka Connect rebalancing? This is so fun, but can we first just have a shout out to Kafka Streams, which has used the Sticky Assigner for a very long time before everyone else. Shout and out. And nobody knows about the Sticky yeah. Assigner. When That's it's great. Kind of and also fun. the static assignment. Yeah. Which is like newer feature and also nobody knows about and makes a lot of things way better. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so a hundred percent. And I, I don't like, I call, you know, KIPs are like amazing, wonderful sources of information. They're super fun um, to read. And the consumer incremental rebounds protocol is KIP 429 um, that, that goes over this. And it even has like, I love this. It even has like, like pictures. Like, I'm like, this is great. It's very visual. <laughs> it's very, I know. I, you know, and so, yes, first, the answer to the question is yes, first of all. Um, and the details you can read about uh, at your delight in KIP 429, um, which goes over what, what it was needed, you know, metadata updates, how we do it, what the edge cases are. I mean, it's a fantastic source. And uh, Confluent actually has two blog posts, one specific for the uh, Connect and then another one that kind of expanded into both streams and the uh, Kafka consumers. I believe that the awesome Sophie, who is a huge contributor to Kafka stream, has wrote the blog post. So Sophie yeah, is Sophie. a phenom. She's so cool. <laughs> I love Sophie. A hundred percent. Okay. That's the, it's one of those episodes that just keep on giving. We had uh, Jason Gustafsson explain exactly once, and ever since we keep getting more, more and more questions about exactly once. We are going to try really hard. Exactly once is a bit difficult. Um, so the question from Mazen Ezedin, exactly one proce once processing is guaranteed after, under fault tolerance. For instance, say one of the servers in the producer Kafka cluster, Kafka stream cluster, or consumers is down, can exactly once guarantee recovery with exactly once guarantee. And I love it because he actually thinks about the entire chain as servers, like including the producers and the consumers, which yeah. absolutely no one ever does, but it is absolutely the right way to think about things. So it's really nice. So Anna, what do you think? Do we, if I crash a random server from the list, will I still get exactly once? So I think, yeah, it comes down to the idea. And like, um, I, it was it, the Bay Area meetup um, that Jason did, uh, like, I think it was last, maybe last summer, is amazing. That is like such a good talk. It's fantastic. And he talks in there about the idea of these operations being atomic, right? Um, when you're talking about transactions. So, you know, what ends up happening is, you know, that isn't going to be like the, the whole operation is atomic, both, you know, the right and also, you know, the, the commit of, yes, I wrote this. Here's my point where I'm, you know, up to. Here's my point where this is a safe thing. So once you have an atomic commit, it, like, if both didn't get go, right, then it won't it won't say, yeah, this is, this is accurate. So if you crash in the middle, right, it knows when to roll it back. So, you know, and, and not to say that there aren't edge cases, right, and poorly, poorly implemented uh, applications, right? It's up to, to the mercy. For example, like in Kafka Streams, I think people 
commonly the most misunderstood thing, and I spend my life saying this, like do not introduce side effects because what they'll end up doing is they'll do something like call out to a rest service in the middle of their topology <laughs> and do an insert or something and then wonder, it's exactly once. Why have I just, you know, reinserted the same thing 80 million times, right? So And that, also, why is it taking so long? Why is it blocking? Yeah. Like, there was a lot of issues yeah. with this. So it's important that you read and you understand what that guarantee is, right? That the guarantee for exactly once, um, it guarantees as if the message is only read exactly once when you use a read committed consumer, right? If you throw something in the middle of that, there's no exactly once guarantee and in the middle of the processing. It's the end thing. You hit at the point where I think this is actually a trick question because the Kafka stream cluster has the guarantee from the point it consumes to the point it produces. But the producer and consumers that you have really depends on your implementation. Mm-hmm. Like you have to find the transactional ID. You have to make sure that if the same trans- producer goes away, it comes back, it comes back with the same transactional I- I- ID. Like you have to do a, quite a bit of work to do that. Yeah. Well, here's a fun part. This is what I've seen too. I've seen happen where like when, if you have a standalone vanilla consumer, right? That's read committed. It's up to you to guarantee that no messages that aren't transactional are written into the topic it's consuming from. Because if a message comes in and that metadata doesn't say it's transactional, that read committed consumer will read it. And I so have no idea, really? Yeah. Well, the way that it works, right? Yeah. And and you know, this is at a very, very high level, is that there's a, you know, it's also why it's it's fascinating when you go down this rabbit hole. It's also why you can't replicate transactions, right? Because the trans what what ends up happening is a message comes in and it has a flag in the metadata that says, I'm a transactional message. So the consumer buffers those up until it gets a control message. And, you know, that can be either an abort or a commit. If the commit, if it's a commit message, it pulls them down. Now, if a message comes in and in the metadata, it says, I'm not transactional, consumer will just read it. I saw that the consumer will just read it immediately and not buffer. It, well, it now, will. Now I have to go try it out. Well, it that's will read it idea. immediately and not buffer. That, and that's kind of the point is that if you mix transactional and non-transactional messages, right, in, a to- in one topic, and you have a read committed consumer, people sometimes think, oh, it will only read committed transactions. Oh, but no. It'll read both. It'll read anything that's not transactional and committed transactions. So I always tell people, it's don't don't mix. That's don't ever mix. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's a bad idea to mix, and it becomes really hard to reason about. And what if you commit something, and then it's part of the transaction, not part of the transaction? Like it gets very messy. So I'm with you. Just don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And another question from Mazen Ezedin on the exact same topic. Given a stream of events, E1, E2, that traverses the whole pipeline, as we just described, at times T1, T2, under at least one's guarantee, uh, the stream of events will traverse the whole pipeline at T1 plus 100 milliseconds, T2 plus 100 milliseconds. So I think what he asks is that will the delay of read committed basically delay the entire stream in a, a uniform fashion? Like, because you're waiting for the first transaction to get committed and then kind of everything else just streams after that. And I haven't tried it, I'm kind of tempted, but just reasoning about it, I would say yes. Like the first transaction, like you'd get high latency for the first transaction, but everything else will already be in flight by the time you get the first transaction. You will not get more latency for anything else. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. And I think I think, you know, I'm tra- yeah, a transaction one, a transaction another. Yes, I would, ag- I would agree with that. This question, I'm having trouble trying to figure out exactly what they're asking. But it allows me to plug in my newest favorite thing in Kafka. I don't know if you've seen that in our rough, the rough, the rough implementation was merged this week. And one of the things it includes is the test framework that allows you yeah. to do things in a very predictable way. So you can kind of inject events and it runs on one thread with one queue of events. So you can say, do leader election and now do a network partition and now mm-hmm. do another leader election and now check that the high watermark is all in place. I'm thinking that this kind of test would kind of allow you to just check the scenario. Like you have one transaction, like you put in the delays to make sure that it takes exactly mm-hmm. 100 milliseconds to commit. And then you see what happens to the next transaction in line. Yeah. I mean, and I love that. Like, that's my favorite thing about it is that new testing framework. So being able to, you know, 
deterministically like trigger certain cases is like huge. Yeah. Um, so I'm very excited. I just became that. an evangelist for that test. I, I, you know that it came from Foundation DB? No, I did not know that. They did a talk about it in a strange loop at some point, and apparently Jason got really inspired. That is so cool. I'm excited about that. Yeah. So now I'm trying to tell everyone it's a thing because I feel like it will just change the world of distributed systems testing. Yes, I agree. I think it's life changing, at least for me personally, under quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> so as you may have noticed, uh, Confluent Platform 6.0 uh, shipped today with the preview, I believe, of cluster linking. And uh, as one does, Tim did a video. And it looks like people are very excited about it. Sai Krishna Boina, Boina uh, says, fantastic, glad to see this new feature. It will save huge time and complexity for replicating cluster topics. And I say, yes, I'm also glad to see this feature. It will save huge time and complexity for replicating cluster topics. And I think you have the most experience ever in these kind of scenarios. So tell us how cluster linking will change everything. So I think one of the things is, is, is the possibilities cluster linking opens up. So currently, um, there is no way right now, um, you know, with replicator, mirror maker, whatever you want to say, to replicate and keep offset parity, right? And that causes a lot of issues when you try to reason between two topics when you're doing asynchronous replication. Um, so for one, being able to respond and have, you know, that sort of determination that, you know, okay, um, let's say, for example, and I'm, I'm a field person now, which is so fun. Um, so, you know, a, a good example is somebody who is providing data, right, to, to another person. Like they're selling a data feed, for example. If someone calls them and they say, look, I didn't get this message, right, and they ask them, right, first thing they're going to ask is, well, what's your lag? Let me go look. And the beautiful thing is now you can deterministically reason, oh, okay, this offset yeah, in my source. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Like that, that is really, really cool. Um, I think, you know, to call out some of the, um, the things that I've seen in Kafka growing, um, this just fits in so well. One of those is, you know, with like something like KSQL, right? You, we get data scientists now who want to play around. And just, and I always say, just like you wouldn't let marketing go nuts in your production Oracle cluster, probably not a good idea to let people go wild and crazy running anything they want, any queries or streams in your production Kafka cluster, not a good place. And so the idea of having that type of like real, almost, you know, almost real time data science, like cluster sitting over here that you could use cluster linking with to just kind of go nuts and try to find insights. This is perfect for that. Um, oh, Anna, I mean, I let everyone run whatever they want on any one of my 600 production clusters. You're, What's the you're very, How bad you're can it be? <laughs> yeah, I, I, the, 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 some of the industries I work in, right, they, they would frown on that. They're not, but then again, we are like, you know, the best multi-tenant people in the entire world, right? So if you have protections, then maybe, but you still can't protect against everything. Even with the new KIPs that are going in, you can still have a consumer that'll tank a node. Even if you have request code as bytes in, bytes out, everything on the face of the sun, you could still have it happen. So I always say better safe than sorry. Okay, next question. This is on uh, Vic Gamov's Confluent live streams. Um, Anna Kovaleva, and I just want to say that I absolutely did not pick this question just because uh, we have two Annas on the show, although who knows. Uh, Anna Kovaleva asked for exact example for business metrics based on events. And I said, oh, I have someone who works with customers. I can probably get some business metrics based on events. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I think I need to, like, if, if somebody asked me this question, I would say, what do you mean by business metrics? Because I think, you know, that can mean a lot of different things. So if, if we, I guess, you know, let's, let's interpret it a certain way. What do you think, Gwen, when you hear business metrics? Yeah, so I was also thinking exactly about that because I was having a hard time finding any business metrics that is really not based on events. I was thinking like, for example, the Uber S1. They had a lot of metrics that they described their business. One of them was proportion of Uber rides as part of all the hired car rides, right? So you accumulate all everything that is in taxis and all the Uber competitors, all the car rides in New York City, what proportion? Yeah. 
is an Uber. That's a good business metric. Right. If you're Uber. <laughs> yeah. And there's a ton of those types. So if that's how we're interpreting this question to mean that, then all the time, all day long, one of the things I see a lot of is like new signups, right? So like we're tracking an event every time a customer signs up for this or that or the other thing, and then we can get a rate of new signups, right? Um, campaigns, like when people roll out new campaigns, what's the engagement rate, right? Using an event like that, how long do they stay on this webpage? All of those kind of business metrics um, are, are coming to play every day at customer sites that I go in. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm actually having a hard time thinking of any business metric that I couldn't translate into an event. Like even like the most financial ones, like revenue mm -hmm. based on sales, a sale is an event. Like how- Not only that, but the absence of events. Those are the best. Like I always say that, like, you know, the absence of something can be just as valuable as its presence, right? So if yeah. we, yeah, if we track like, okay, we have a series, we see like, and you can think about it as maybe somebody who, you know, signs up for like, let's say there's like four courses, right? And they sign up for three, right? And never sign up for the fourth part of it. Why? Right. So tracking an absence of an event, too, can be very valuable in Kafka and Kafka streams. Let's yeah, do that. Like basically what all the churn metrics are. Yeah, about, exactly. Right? right. So events, absence of them, all of it you can do in Kafka and Kafka streams, which rules. That's amazing. Yeah, I love it. I mean, we should do an episode just you explaining how to do it in Kafka streams. <laughs> I can. Yeah. If we ever did like a topology with an episode, that'd be so fun. Topology, Susanna. Okay. I, I love topologies. <laughs> so. Tim Berglund had an incredibly popular, we did an, one episode just on that, like what is Apache Kafka video and all, like apparently people got jobs based on watching this video. <laughs> so ended up being quite popular. Imon Andrews said, you've copyrighted Kafka. What is the point anymore? And I think it's a misunderstanding that I just need to clarify and move on. I just couldn't let it go. We, copyrighted Apache, uh, Apache Kafka, as in the Apache Software Foundation absolutely has a trademark and it has a trademark on the name Apache Kafka, which is what you're seeing here. It's our a registered trademark. It also has copyright, which is the C thingy, over the entire Apache Kafka code base. So the U in place is the Apache Software Foundation they always had trademark over Apache Kafka. They've always had trademark over every single line of code in Apache Kafka, a copyright over every single line of code. It is under the Apache software license, but the code belongs to a foundation, which is a nice place for the code of an open source project to be. It gives us the, our beloved governance structure with the PMC and committers and all that. So Confluent, absolutely never could, never did copyright anything with the word Kafka in it. This is like the most important rule in being a commercial player in the open source space. The trademark belongs to the foundation and we do, and the registered trademarks there means that it's a registered trademark of Apache Software Foundation. Always has been, always will be. Okay, we had Kafka Summit recently. Anna, what was your favorite talk? Uh, Matthias's. Yes, I loved that. <laughs> I, I adored it. I, I, he even gave me a, a preview of it. Um, you know, and time semantics is something that's misunderstood wildly, like everywhere. I spend a lot of time explaining stream time versus wall clock time um, and, and, you know, how we tick windows, all of those things and the visuals, especially. And I want to call that out um, in his presentation are fantastic. Yeah. Um, if you're a visual person, it isn't the it isn't the the Alice table you know, kind of thing that we've all seen so many times. It's beautiful and it really does add like a layer of understanding. I think if people had, they just, they would be so much more successful. I'm with you. I always got into trouble by being unable to reason about time semantics in terms, especially around joints. It can get incredibly yeah. tricky. And uh, Matthias clarifying it was a fairly big deal. Yeah. I like the talk from Bloomberg because they built this entire platform around uh, Kafka. And I really love seeing the, like they went to a lot of details on how they enabled Kafka across the org by building this platform. So I, um, yeah, I like it when people do that. Like I like it when engineers take as a mission to enable good things across an entire organization. And I like their approach. 
And then I, from Confluent, I really liked uh, Anna Povner's talk, but I'm very biased. <laughs> We're working closely. Way, though, it, was, it was awesome. And she's the queen of Kafka multi-tenancy. And I'm just okay. lucky enough to know her. Absolutely. And uh, Vivek Singh apparently was very inspired by Jay's uh, morning keynote. And he's like, let's remove Zookeeper. And I think we can all go and say, Yay! <laughs> I, I agree. Gwen, can I ask you something about the zookeeper removal? Yes. Do you think this will help drive, um, one thing I've been hearing more and more about from customers is footprint size, right? And removing zookeeper and being able to kind of co-locate, to me, opens up doors for a smaller footprint. And that's not something we talk about a lot. We talk about the ease of configuration, the, you know, getting more partitions for your buck, right? Being able to remove some of the partition limits and things of that nature. But I think it would be neat to, you know, see what happens in the future, too, with being able to, you know, decrease the size of, like, Kafka in a backpack. That's like... Yeah, so yeah. I was thinking, on one hand, enabling IoT use cases and edge use cases is something I'm super passionate about. And I agree with you, like, in those edge use cases where you never really need more than maybe two or three brokers, like, having Zookeeper, it can be a bit uh, painful, especially if it's like if it's something that's fairly low throughput, low uh, utilization. There's just no need. But I'm also thinking that I wouldn't want people to think about oh, less machines as like the first thing they think of, because to be honest, none of us still know how much resources the <laughs> quorum will take, <laughs> and uh, what if it takes more resources than Zookeeper? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, that's, that's, that, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I tend to get overexcited. Yeah, no, I, I think I am excited about it. But like, if, if bin packing Zookeeper with Kafka was a no brainer in every case, we would have done it ages ago. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of cases where it's quite risky. Like Zookeeper basically dies if it doesn't get timely access to the CPU. Mm -hmm. Like straight out dies. It depends on it. Same thing for timely access to disk. So collocating Zookeeper with anything is very risky. Um, colloc now the quorum may end up being a lot less risky, like it has this log of events, maybe it will not uh, need this very timely CPU access, but you know, I haven't <laughs> run it in production yet <laughs> and I will probably do it slowly and carefully. Okay, I think we are at the section of the show called backpatting uh, team and each other. Uh, where we just pick up some compliments uh, from the internet to make us feel, all feel better about uh, doing our jobs. So this is about the Apache Kafka goes global uh, with cluster linking, which we discussed earlier. Uh, George Leonard says, just about every time I watch a video of an announcement, I'm blown away. Awesome, guys. So I want to think that he's blown away in two ways the awesomeness of the feature we delivered and the awesomeness of the video uh, talking about it. Which do you think is more awesome? <laughs> I, you know, I, I have to say delivery is everything. Like I said, I, <laughs> you could, you could, I, I think you could poorly deliver like the best thing in the world and, and, and vice versa to a point. But I think we always seem to hit the sweet spot and Tim is, you know, fantastic. So yeah. that, that is fantastic and cluster linking is world changing so definitely yeah. a very good combination tim berglund gave the closing keynote at um, kafka summit and az said tim never fails to disappoint with his analogies and passion and i think it's meant to be a compliment it read like a compliment when i first saw it um <laughs> I believe it's a, that's a high compliment. That's like the best compliment. Never fails to disappoint is a compliment? Yeah, because he's never disappointed. Oh, okay. So never disappoints is a compliment. Um, <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. I read that yeah, it's just like I've read it a few times and now it seems a bit weird in my head. So but like, does he mean he's always disappointed? Or she never fails to disappoint, he's always disappoint, right? But how can you disappoint if you have good analogies and a lot of passion? That's right. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and the exclamation point is also another. Yeah. yeah. So let's yeah, just. No, I think the guy like, was excited, too excited, yeah. and so excited that he had trouble uh, phrasing it. In, yeah. Or lady. Yeah. We don't know. It's AZ. Or, or they or them. One of the two. Yeah. Whoever it was. And I picked up a compliment for myself. I also did a keynote <laughs> on uh, Kafka's architecture, where I talked a lot about my favorite kids. 
Uh, Abhishek Gupta said nice presentation and that tiered storage is a game changer. And I think we just spent a good portion of the episode agreeing yeah. with Abhishek Gupta. Same video about what is Apache Kafka. Some people are actually paying attention to the content and not misunderstanding the trademarks. Um, <laughs> so to be fair, trademarks can be complicated. But uh, Vimal said, very well explained. Thank you for sharing it. And uh, yeah, I basically have to agree. It's very well explained. If you happen to be listening to this video and got this far and you feel like we're basically talking Chinese because this is kind of like a very advanced episode with a lot of content that if you're not super familiar with Kafka, you may feel a bit lost. And this is the video you really want to watch. So like, thank you for surviving with us uh, talking Greek to you so far. Um, but go watch the video. You will understand a lot more about what Kafka is about. And then you can come back and understand why cluster linking is game changing. Right. And that's all we have for today. So yeah, it was tons of fun. Thank you for all the answers, Anna. And amazing questions from the community. I'm really glad that the call for extra, extra hard questions worked. Like this was literally one of our most advanced episodes. I really appreciate you, Anna, kind of stepping up to the challenge and not never failing to disappoint. I got it. <laughs> not disappointing us and answering all those questions and having the, really sharing those really great customer stories. I really loved it. Thank and, you. And it's great to see everyone who wrote in, who comments on our YouTube, all the people in the community just learning more and more about Kafka, whether they are very new to Kafka and going to watch the newbie video about what is Kafka at all, or people with a lot of experience who want advanced topics like global Kafka. Keep up the learning. We are all in this together. I agree. And stay safe, everybody. We'll get out of this soon. One day at a time. <laughs> One day at a time. That's the new motto. <laughs>